Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Data Diversity. We want to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will discuss building a data strategy, practical steps for aligning with business goals, sponsored today by Incorda. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A panel, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag take DA strategies. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, the chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. To open the chat and the Q&A panels, you will find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen to enable those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides and the recording of this session and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me turn it over to Mohit for a brief word from our sponsor, Incorda. Mohit, hello. Hello and welcome. Uh, thanks, Shannon. Uh, glad to be here. Um, and I, I'd like to extend my welcome to everybody who has, who has taken an important uh, hour from their, from their daily work and, and joined this webinar. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, so, sorry. It's not what I wanted. Uh, wrong button. Uh, so a, a, a quick overview of who we are. Uh, so we are we are an end-to-end -end data analytics platform. We were we were founded in uh, 2014. Uh, we are a Series D company with the with the backing of uh, world-class investors, including uh, uh, Google and Microsoft. Um, we are headquartered here in in US with with offices in UK and Middle East, and 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 have over uh, 400 employees, um, and and that includes. Uh, uh, a total of 600, uh, 600 plus years of engineering work uh, that is primarily focusing on uh, solving the application data problem with a, with a fundamentally different um, approach than, than the other data analytics uh, solutions that you, that you see in the market. Um, so overall, if you think about it, right, uh, you know, one of the one of the key objectives of uh, of any uh, data solution is to is to enable agile analytics for for business, and and this is not uh, uh, to 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 only include the ability to ingest the data as quickly and as efficiently as possible, but 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 more importantly, uh, give end users the the ability to quickly uh, respond to the changing business requirements for 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 their data and analysis need. And, and and this is uh, you know this is especially true during during the pandemic, right? I mean, um, during pandemic, you, you know, you can have new data sources that that may become available at a at a short notice, and and users may have to um, act at a moment notice to analyze and make uh, decisions based based on that data. So um, so the modern data solutions have have done a good job, you know, in terms of. Uh, uh, you know, acquiring the data by, but 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 making that data available to the business in the in the format that that users can understand and 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 consume, um, you know, continues to be a challenge, right? Uh, so so this is this has actually become a uh, become a big pain point for the for the customers that that we deal with, and 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 where we see like huge bottlenecks and and reporting backlogs uh, that 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 span over weeks and months, if if not years. And, and I think one of the one of the key reasons behind that is the is the need to physically transform and aggregate data before uh, before it can be uh, you know served through the BI tools and 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 this this not only you know uh, obviously slows down the the time to insight but but also causes uh, significant loss of the data in that in that process as well. So um, you know Encoda Encoda is built. Uh, Built on top of the open data formats such as uh, Delta Lake and Parquet files uh, that supports uh, you know the, the the asset transactions to 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 ensure that you, you you always get a full and consistent view of the data at at, at scale um, and and it supports things like you know time travel and Apache Spark and and can be used for 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 machine learning and 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 big data um, uh, use cases as well, but. But the key differentiator with with within Coda, uh, you know, compared to other solutions, is that there is there is a, there is no need to physically transform the data, right? The the data always stays in the same shape and form as the data source, right? And 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 the way we do it is, you know, we leverage 
leverage the same uh, primary key index and the joins from the from the source uh, to link and transform the data, right? So, so, so there is no need to flatten the data set or, or create surrogate keys or, or or create target schemas or, or start schemas, right? Once once the data is ingested and and mapped using the source metadata, um, it's 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 basically ready for for consumption, right? So this this uh, actually provides a uh, an unprecedented level of uh, agility to the business to then be able to explore and, and, and build insights freely without having to constantly model or, or remodel uh, their data all the time. Um, so, and, 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 given, and given that the data is always in the same grain as the, uh, as the source system, uh, you have access to 100% of the data, right? You can, you can use that data to, to, to summary level uh, uh, analysis. You can you can then you know drill drill down all the way to the transaction level details from uh, from from that summary level uh, reports, while while still maintaining the complete you know control over security and governance of the data. So uh, you know here is a here is a quick case study uh, that I wanted to share with with everybody on 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 one of the one of the largest media companies in the world and and how they were able to. Um, you know, transform their their business using using Encoda. So, so as you can tell, right, it's a it's a it's a fairly complex environment with uh, you know like five different solutions. Uh, you know that 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 included data warehouse, uh, you know ETL tool, and, and of course a BI tool, and and then they had multiple data sources with uh, with 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 over thousand reports and and two thousand users. So, so even after you know setting up multiple servers to to improve uh, the overall system performance, the customer was still stuck with uh, with the with the daily data refreshes and 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 it was taking um, you know more than two minutes to 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 run an average query in in their system. So, so with Encoda, uh, they were able to consolidate uh, all of that into one reporting solution, right? So, Encoda, given it's a it's an all-in-one end-to-end platform. They were able to get rid of you know all the different uh, tools that they had to you know stitch together uh, to 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 put together a, a BI solutions for their users. So so which basically you know not only improved uh, the data ingestion speed but but also significantly improved uh, time it 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 takes them to uh, you know uh, explore and build new insights right. So so the data load frequency went went up by hundred x almost right. So earlier. Earlier, they were able to load data only once a day, uh, but with Encoda, uh, they 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 get near real time access to data. They were they were able to load data every every fifteen minutes. Um, the 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 time to insight went up by by ten x, right? So 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 from nine days to to less than a day, and and this is uh, you know this is for the for the complex insights that that require uh, you know new data sets or or, or new business logic. So, so in, in summary, right, you know, whether you are new to data analytics or a, or a veteran in this field, uh, I, I, I hope this was, this was helpful and, and, and how Encoda is, is fundamentally a different approach in, in solving the application data problems and, and, and how it can, uh, you know, complement or, or, or fit into your uh, data strategy. So, so feel free to, to reach out to us through Encoda.com or for, for any additional information. Um, we do have a free trial that, that you can use to experience Encoda by yourself. Uh, so, so would en encourage everybody to, to check us out and, and sign up for free trial uh, and, and, and bring, bring your own data, bring your own data to, to Encoda and see, see, see how it works. Uh, so with that, uh, Shannon, I'll pass it back to you, thanks. Well, hit. Thank you so much for kicking us off, and thanks to Encorda for sponsoring and helping to make these webinars happen. Always appreciated. And if you have questions for Mahit or about Encorda, you may submit your questions in the Q and A panel, and he will be joining us in the Q and A portion of the webinar at the end here. 
Uh, so um, now let me introduce the speaker of the monthly series, Donna Burbank. Donna is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She currently is the managing director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. And with that, let me give the floor to Donna to begin her presentation. Hello and welcome. Hello, Shannon. Um, always a pleasure to do these. Great to be back. Um, yeah, so just, just before we start, uh, if we jump to slide three, um, if you this is your first time visiting us at one of these data diversity webinars, um, this is a monthly series. Um, and, and one of the questions that always comes up that I'll, I'll answer here and, and, and Shannon will and mention it again, is that all of these uh, webinars are recorded. So if you missed any um, this year or several of the past years we've been doing this, they're all available in kind of the digital library of Dataversity. Um, and then I hope next month you'll be able to join us as we talk in deeper uh, about master data management. But if we go to the next slide, uh, the topic for today is data strategy, always a popular one. Um, as you can see by the name of our company, that's literally what we do for a living. Uh, so I'm always passionate to talk about that. And I think, <clears throat> I mean, I'll talk about this later in the deck and, and often throughout the, the, the slides, um, is that really when we talk about data strategy, the thing that really differentiates the data strategy from just good old fashioned data management, it's also a question I get, what is that difference, is really that business value in the business driver. And when you're thinking of strategy, the, really, uh, the, the significant aspect of that is that it's going to drive a lot of the key initiatives in today's marketplace. Think of you know, so many of the the key uh, successful companies in the globe, you know, your Amazons, your Uber, et cetera, they're all data driven. They, they are data companies. So um, very, very you know, strategic part of a lot of companies' business plans. If we go to the next slide, um, you'll see, um, and this probably isn't a surprise if you haven't been hiding under a rock, this idea of this, uh, the rise of the data-driven business. Um, if, if, you know, a lot of um, our interest in data strategy does come from business users who may have seen a article like this. And for, if you look at the title, these are all business magazines, Forbes, Harvard Business Review, Wall Street Journal, et cetera, all talking about data and the data-driven business. I'm sure we've all heard that, you know, famous quote of data science being the sexiest job of the 21st century. I think they meant data architect or data modeler, but I'll give them that data quality error. Um, but again, uh, that's a good thing. Uh, but how do you how do you balance that you know need for business agility with getting that right architecture behind it? And we'll talk a lot about that. Um, if we go to the next slide six, um, one of the things I, I, I've been doing with Dataversity the past few years is, a, and I think we're going to be launching it soon for next year or this current year, um, is kind of a survey of data management professionals and and seeing you know what are some of these key trends. Uh, what I am heartened to see um, I, I've, is the, this, the, these statistics that you see, you know, over 70% of respondents felt that their organization sees data as a strategic asset. So you might sort of yawn and say, yeah, of course, you know, you know, uh, nothing new there. Um, but I think that's significant uh, because, I mean, I've been in the industry, gosh, over 25 years now, and that hasn't always been the case. I know I, when we would go to a lot of, um, you know, data diversity or enterprise data world type conferences, a lot of it was, yeah, we're not getting the attention of the business. We're an afterthought. And I kind of think, you know, be careful what you ask for <laughs> now because most companies data is top of mind. And with that comes a spotlight. So are we ready for that spotlight? Um, when you look at the drivers for the data driven business, Probably no surprise at that second bullet point that, you know, almost 70% is all about saving costs and increasing efficiency. I mean, that's been true probably since the, the dawn of humanity, right? One of the, the, the first things people saw on, on old, you know, rock walls and things were, were counting, right? Accounting and, and <laughs> counting how many bushels of rice you had, right? Um, so that's kind of always been uh, a point of data management. Uh, but what I'm seeing more of, and it is pretty exciting, is this idea of digital transformation um, over 60%, and that, that's actually growing. If you look, again, we do this each year, that's over um, over 10% from, from 2019, and, and I know I'm seeing that with most of my com customers that, you know, especially, and, and Mohit mentioned uh, kind of COVID, that sort of made digital a necessity. You know, companies that thought they could never could be digital are um, – and then you realize that your your data really needs to be right. You know, data really is that foundation of digital transformation, and, and that might sound trite or kind of overused, but it's absolutely true um, 
just was interviewing a, an exec yesterday, and that was her point of we're trying to go digital. We can't go digital without data. And I said yes, <laughs> and that you know some folks realize that up front and are prepared, and some people realize it after the fact and have to kind of catch up. But either way, uh, data is digital. So if we go to the next slide, um, seven, then. Um, I mentioned this in the beginning, but it's probably worth mentioning again. This is one of the common questions, especially people who have been in the business for a long time, of haven't we been doing data strategy for a long time? It's kind of a new buzzword uh, from the business, but I feel like we've been doing that. And you may have. Again, data has been driving businesses since the dawn of time. But I, I think even more so with this digital world, um, it's increasing. And there are differences between data management and data strategy. So I went a good old Webster's Dictionary. Um, I'm a, I'm a data architect, data modeler. I, I like the definitions of things, right? Metadata is important. So I have my own metadata here. If you look at the definition of management, um, you know, maybe it's not the best uh, definition there. <laughs> it's the art or act of managing, right? Or, or supervising or the judicious use of means to accomplish an end. Well, that, that's important, um, but it sort of feels like housekeeping. You know, things you need to do. You know, I'm, I'm making things more efficient. I'm kind of managing my, you know, pencils in the pencil desk. That's important, um, but doesn't, not sexy, it doesn't sound exciting. If you look at strategy, a, it's, it's, you know, employing plans or strategies towards a goal. It's complex adaptations, achieving evolutionary success, the science and art of meeting the enemy under advantageous conditions. Uh, seems a bit more dramatic, but um, also it's that idea of, of business goals and, and, and aligning what you're doing with data um, with, with your business. And you know, again, it's in our name. We do a lot of data strategies and what my team always gets probably tired of me saying is what's the so what? I love data. I love business glossaries. I love data models. I love data architecture. But the, if, if you don't have the so what of why we're doing that, um, that's where it becomes just, you know, data management for data management's sake and not so much a data strategy. And, and, and hopefully that kind of clarifies. It's often what the, you know, one of the few questions we get of what do we mean by a data strategy? And to me, that's it. It's really aligning all your resources around that. So what? Um, to achieve some goal. If we go to the next slide, um, eight, after that question of what's the data strategy, and I give an answer similar to the one that you just got, um, I often get the question, but like literally what is it? Like, like my boss asked me for a strategy. Is, is that like a, a document? Is there a template? Is a, you know, my slightly joke there, interpretive dance. Um, <laughs> what, what do I do um, to present this? Um, Back to the interpretive dance, we could joke there, but actually one of my clients was getting her uh, master's degree in kind of population uh, health and, and science, and um, that was one of her options for her, her final thesis was you could either do a report with your data analytics or a poem or a dance, <laughs> and the reason was – some of the, it's so easy to get lost in the data. Some of the research they were doing was, you know, how many people died this year Donna? due to homelessness? Yep. Yeah, I apologize. Um, it looks like we are, um, our, my slides aren't matching yours. I apologize, y'all. We have a connectivity issue, so I'm trying to drive the slides for Donna. So you said slide eight, but that's what is data strategy, strategy versus management. Oh, next slide then. What is it really? Dine, uh, slide nine is data-driven business. Uh, is there one that has a pile of papers that says, what is it really? Do we have no. a, a thinking issue? Oh. <laughs> we, have a, we have a thinking issue. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, maybe I will send you another email with the latest. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> we have some technical issues, so trying to make it all work. Yeah, here. gotta love technology. You now know our secret. I'm literally on a landline. I'm at a, a client that doesn't have uh, connectivity. So. <laughs> um, okay, let me send you that as we as we all go, right. um, and I'll just keep babbling away as I do. Um, Right. But um, that, that is a question people get in terms of, you know, what would be the format? And I kind of joked about interpretive dance, but in, in terms of that client, it was, um, you know, a lot of the research uh, she was doing was, again, how many people died due to homelessness or lack of housing this year? Or how many folks have, you know, uh, issues with AIDS and you know, very weighty subjects. And sometimes we get so into the data, we kind of forget the so what. Again, that was a very impactful so what. <laughs> so I do at least have one uh, sort of strategy that was done in a poem or interpretive dance. Probably not what you want to do for your CEO, however. Um, 
So um, I often say um, it, a PowerPoint, uh, partly because a PowerPoint is a really good way to tell a story. A PowerPoint makes you concise, um, you know, kind of that classic 10, 20 slides not more. Um, you know, the actual strategy might be hundreds of slides with all the detail in the back. Um, you may have a Word document. Uh, in fact, we're working with several kind of um, federal agencies or, or com countries um, that have, you know, the UK, the US have a published data strategy that generally is going to be a Word document, right, of, of you know, hundreds of pages of the, or, you know, dozens of pages of this is our data strategy. I would say if you are in, in a company and, and you gave someone the big heavy word document, you've, I don't want to say you've failed, but that'll probably end up on the shelf. Um, we come in often um, and are given, you know, say we, we need to revamp our strategy. We tried to do it last year and it, it just didn't land. And we're given kind of the, again, 100 page, 50 page word document. And, and we look at it, we say, you know, there's nothing wrong with this. Actually, it was all very solid data management. But it, why didn't it land? It, it wasn't sold. You know, it didn't, didn't either align with the business or even if it did, you know, people, no one, everyone is ADD now, right? Everyone's busy um, and, and, and it probably was not presented. So that's why I, if I were to pick, um, I would say put it in a PowerPoint. So in I'm terms of what, oh, yep. Sorry, Donna, I thought there was a break there. I'm on slide eight. I'm on slide eight with the pile of papers on it. Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, great. In terms of the, the the format is one thing, and then what what would that include? Um, kind of the section headers. Again, there could be lots of things, um, but generally, well, always I would say, <laughs> uh, start with the business. Why are we doing it? What's the case for change? What's the value proposition? Think of it. You're selling to a CEO that probably has you know dozens of priorities. Why should he or she invest in this data thing that's probably very obtuse, probably not something that they can understand um, more of than buying a new building or hiring new people, right? You're always selling whether you think you, whether you like that or not. The world's all, all about marketing, right? Um, and then kind of you, you've got their attention. Um, and, and then what's the so what? So what, what's the issue now? Um, either the opportunity or the pain points. You know, it's kind of the easier one to find the pain points. We can't do this because... I would caution, and, and I am a data management professional, proud card-holding <laughs> member, but we tend to be seen as negative, and we often are negative because it, when you think of it, a lot of things we're doing is solving problems. But think of an exec. They're often opportunity-driven, right? And so having someone come in is like, well, your data quality is terrible and you can't do I mean, that that often is a way to get attention, and often that's a very relevant thing. But when you can, could it be, hey, we would really get a leg up on our competitors if we could, or, or maybe switch, we'll flip the script a little bit to be more positive because, you know, you're, you're trying to make this something people can get excited about and people get more excited about opportunity than the problems. Um, and then what do you do about, about it? Again, how often we're doing strategies. I, I always remember this, like the analogies, you go to the doctor and they say, yep, you're sick. Here you go. Um, that's not so helpful, right? But here's your sick, here's the, the medicine you can take or exercise more or whatever it is, reduce your stress. Um, don't just go to your CEO or whoever you're selling this to with a problem, they want a solution. And then some sort of roadmap for how, to, how and when are you gonna do this? That's great, you've sold me, I love it. It's gonna be a year, a month, um, you know, can, and can I build it in, in, in steps and when might I get this kind of ROI and benefit? So again, that, that might be obvious, I find, you know, writing down the obvious and kind of sticking to it is a really helpful way because, again, when you're talking about a strategy, you want it succinct and kind of clear. Um, so now if we move to slide nine, um, when we think of the value where it talks business optim, I, I like to, to clarify between business optimization, which is becoming a data-driven company, and business transformation, which is becoming a data company. Um, I would say most companies should do the one on the left. That's kind of that classic when you saw the stats from Dataversity. You know, how do we um, be more efficient? How do we eliminate manual efforts? Um, how do we grow our revenue with better marketing campaigns, better, you know, data about our products that we can enhance? And you might say, you know, we've been doing that forever. Again, since the beginning of time, data has been helping companies make more money or, or helping nonprofits, you know, serve more people. Um, but data now with so many tools and technologies um, can help you do that a lot better and more efficiently. I would say any organization um, should be looking at it that way. Some organizations choose to become a data company. I mean, and when we advise corporations, we think, you know, you may not want to do this. It doesn't, it's not for everybody. It isn't, it's not a good or bad thing. It's just, does this opportunity make sense for you? But this is where 
Data is the product. Can you take your data and monetize some of it? Could you um, sell it for ad revenue? Could you build a new product from it? Um, we've got some, we had a big manufacturing company um, that actually they, they shipped a lot of their project products in, in kind of Latin America where there were a lot of um, roads that couldn't maybe have some big trucks on it and certain bridges that you couldn't travel and certain you could. And they had a lot of data from the IoT of their trucks um, that, that they knew that. And so what they did is kind of create an app uh, think of a, you know, a Waze or a MapQuest or a Google Maps for the shipping industry, which is very unique to kind of back roads and heavy trucks. And they monetize that completely different from their business. But they saw an opportunity, especially in an industry, they, they were kind of heavily reliant on the construction industry, which can go up and down. Uh, so they wanted kind of another source of revenue. And that was a great idea. Um, are there new business models? Think of Uber. Um, is it a cab company on data? Maybe. Um, or is that a completely new business model where they had some really interesting data, um, went to a really interesting conversation, uh, w presentation from some of the Uber engineers and, and the amount of data they get from you know, the flights that are landing at airports and the traffic and, and how many people might be expected, so how many drivers. I mean, it's completely a, a data company with some cabs on top, some, some drivers on top, really, right? Um, new business model. So, uh, again, that's something to think about is how far do we want to go with data? Um, I often tell a story we're working with two very similar companies in the similar industry, one of which, when we sort of said, where do you want to be? They said, we want to be in the left. We want to sell more widgets um, and do it more efficiently. We're not going to be a data company. We just want to sell more widgets. Um, the other company that sold very similar widgets really did want to be a data company and, and, and tried some new business models. Both were very profitable and very successful. So, again, not one is not better than the other. Uh, the one on the right, though, this idea of becoming a data company is pretty exciting um, and is getting a lot of people interested in data. If we go to the next slide, 10, um, what I, one of the reasons I'm still in the industry is that I find this very interesting, that this kind of interdependency from, you know, I think always your business strategy should drive your data strategy. What are we trying to do as an org? Are we a hospital, a school, uh, a startup in Silicon Valley? You know, how, and then what, what, is, what are our goals and how can data support that? Um, that's sort of your, you know, from the, pre the previous slide, the one on the left, how can we be more efficient with data helping that? What's sort of exciting is the, the one on the right, becoming a data company, is that data data can inform your business, right? So your data strategy can sometimes flip, and, and then, then it's a kind of a virtuous cycle. So that's what is kind of fun about being in data now. So if we go to slide 11 with the framework, um, if you've seen my webinars before, you've probably seen this framework, but we do get good feedback on it, and it is a helpful way to kind of um, frame things. So when we're talking business and data strategy, we're at that sort of top of the framework, which is what, what's this top-down alignment with what we're trying to do, um, and what are the goals? But the rest of it is important as well. I don't want to belittle that in this presentation, but we are going to focus a little more on the business side um, because we're talking strategy. A lot of the other webinars this year are more on the architecture, so we will we'll cover that if, that's, if that is of interest to you um, throughout the year. Um, but also in a data strategy is that bottom up. What are we talking about? You know, if you thought of in Corda's earlier slides, you know, it's all of the above, right? Is it a data lake? Uh, is it data warehousing? Do we have our IoT? Do we have documents? Um, and so what is it that we need to manage? And then kind of going up that stack of how do we integrate data like that? Do we have the right metadata around it, the lineage, the definitions, the glossaries? And then kind of that level three of how do we manage it? Um, you know, is the quality good? Do we have the right architecture to support that? And then how can we do the kind of front end things like BI, analytics, AI, machine learning, um, or things like master data management in terms of you know, what we see in our practice, this idea of master data is becoming the, one of the big drivers of a lot of organizations is, again, if you're trying to go digital or trying to do anything, master data drives that. That's your products, your customers, your employees, your patients, your students, your locations, right? All of that that drives your business is master data. Um, and then we'll talk a lot about this in this session. That, that second row, uh, the data governance and, and the collaboration, and we often get questions about that. Why did you add collaboration with data governance? And again, I've been doing this for probably too many years, I want to admit, but, and I'm a super technical person, love the tech, but the more I'm in this business, I realize what makes the tech work is the people and the culture. And 
with very few exceptions in all my career, I don't think anyone has, you know, come to, to business to, to work in the morning and said, you know, I want to have really bad data or I want to create silos or I want to, you know, make, make sure my data is inoperable. What people are doing is trying to get their job done, right? And they may not see the bigger picture. So generally, I feel, and maybe I'm naive, but <laughs> um, getting all of those people in the room so they can see the effects of other groups or make joint decisions about what can be shared or what should be managed or prioritization of things. That's data governance. It just works a lot better. You know, the, the, the carrot works a lot better than the stick. And there's plenty of sticks that can help you with governance, regulation, risk. Um, but we're all human and tend to get more excited about positive things. And, and building that culture is a really great way to get data governance. And all of that is the foundation of a full data strategy. So if we move to the next slide, Again, how do you prioritize all that stuff at the bottom um, when there's a lot to do? And I, I, you know, I'm always looking whenever I do a strategy for what are those quick wins? I'm, I'm not naive <laughs> that I know it may take three years, five years to do everything in that framework, but you can do something in three months, six months, nine months, depending on your company, that's really going to show some business value, and that's going to get people excited to do more. If you don't do that, people aren't going to wait. You may not be in business three years from now if you don't do some of these things. So kind of looking around, you know, what, where could data be the fulcrum? With a little bit of effort, you can get a, um, you know, a, a lot of load moved. So could it be cleaning up some data quality for a marketing campaign that's going to sell more stuff or help more people, right? Um, I had a boss way back that you know, when we'd be working on something, he's like, are you just rearranging the deck chairs in the Titanic, i.e., is this going to offer any value or are you just doing busy work? And he's kind of a rough guy, um, but that stuck with me. And we do a lot of things during the day. Let's focus on the things that are the most Im impactful. So if we move to the next slide, um, some of the ways to, to look at ROI or making the business case, I, I mentioned that at the beginning, um, are, are some of the classic ones, but it's always good to, to look across these. There, there may be more in your industry, but um, decreasing costs or increasing revenue are probably going to be the bigger ones. Even if you're a nonprofit, you need to kind of keep the bottom line in mind, right? So decreasing costs, I often find, is the easier one to quantify. And, and I would say do this at the beginning of any effort because what you want to do is kind of look at that before case. Manual effort is a big one. Often we'll go in and, and look at a company, and, and, and maybe the dashboards are great, maybe the quality is great, and maybe management doesn't see that, but that's done on the back of a lot of people's weekends or nights or, you know, it takes three weeks to build that report because we're cobbling it together with, you know, spreadsheets and Word documents. Um, getting rid of that wasted labor um, is often an easy one to kind of quantify. Are there inefficient business processes around these, et cetera, et cetera? Um, that can also lead to increasing revenue. What, you know, some people get nervous. Well, if, if my people aren't doing this, will they lose their job? <laughs> no. Hopefully, they're doing stuff that's going to drive profitability, right? Doing things that they should be doing rather than kind of wasted effort. Um, or, or, you know, what about how can we optimize price with better analytics? Can we? I already mentioned the marketing campaigns, but um, we just worked with a. Um, it, was, it was an insurance company that was really, really good at data-driven recommendation engines when their, their agents were on the phone. What's the best customer to be talking to, best based on customer profiles and past efforts of that client? Um, totally data-driven, and it was really successful for them to, again, not rearrange the, the deck chairs in the Titanic, but focus on those important things. A risk, again, is super important if you're in the financial industry or healthcare or actually most things. Um, maybe isn't the sexiest one to, le to, to lead with, but again, you know your management. That might be the one thing to lead with. We have to do this because of HIPAA. We have to do this because of GDPR. Um, we, we don't want to get sued. We might be. We work with a restaurant. That was a huge part. You'd think they were all about selling and 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 you know getting more you know people into the restaurant to sell, and that was part of it. But a lot of it was. Are we going to have the right, you know, allergens on the menu so that no one gets sick and sues us? Right? I hadn't thought of that, but that's a, it, was, it was a big part of that. How can they trace the food uh, from where it came and what was on the menu to, to show if there were any, you know, I don't know, peanuts in it or something like that? Um, and then reputation. That's often one that maybe is harder to quantify in terms of numbers, but often is that kind of gut feel that helps you sell it. Like, wouldn't we, you know, actually have a a uh, colleague, he sometimes speaks with me on, on Data Diversity, Nigel Turner, and he loves to tell the story of uh, his local uh, 
what do you call it? I guess we call it the pharmacy boots or whatever. They keep selling him ads for they, – they have his gender as female, and they keep sending him lipstick coupons and things like that. Um, and he always tells that story because he, I don't think, would look good in lipstick. He, he might want to try it, but uh, that's not his his bag. And he finds it very funny that every month they're spending all of this money on ads for, you know, again, new perfumes and new lipstick and things like that that he would never – buy and and not only is that not helping their campaigns and that is probably losing revenue um but it makes them look sort of bad right i mean we've all probably had those stories i once from a hospital got somebody else's medication sent to me that's not only that's a reducing risk but you know i'm not sure i want to go to that hospital where are they going to where are they going to send my my results to somebody else right um or the the classic one i hear from management is we don't want to be in the newspaper um and often that that's kind of a reducing risk um, but, you know, do you sort of look or, or I, I always give a positive example. Um, I am a, a consultant and especially in the before times sort of lived on airplanes. And I would say my my preferred airline does a really good job of, you know, I call and I need to change my flight. And they'll say, Ms. Burbank, are you trying to fly from you know, Denver to London, do you want the same flight you did last year at this time? And I say, yes. <laughs> and I, you know, that could be creepy, but actually that's a very good customer experience based on data. Um, so again, that's kind of that softer stuff, but often there's the stuff that's, you know, can, can, do you ruin your recommendation by having a marketing campaign that's, you know, based on a completely different persona, like a woman versus a man, or are you really targeting your, you know, frequent flyer really well and knowing her flying patterns? That's kind of some, some of that softer stuff. Okay. If we go to the slide 14, the next slide, one that's often forgotten is what is the risk of doing Nothing. And that, and that often can be kind of an impetus. It's easier to do nothing, right? It's easier to keep the status quo. When you're trying to sell something for to your management, inherently you're trying to get them to do something different. So by kind of quantifying that, if we do nothing, this is what we might lose in terms of either wasted time, opportunity cost. Um, often when we well, always, when we go into a strategy, we will look at the competition and say, you know, do you know that your competitor X actually is doing Y and Z, and you might want to keep up with them or, or, or whatever it is with you. Don't don't forget to do that because that's going to help kind of move that momentum forward. If we go to the next slide, 15, as you're working, I, I've talked a lot so far on kind of convincing your management and, and talking upwards, but really you need to, and I'll talk a lot about this at the end when we talk about organizational change management, which is a big part of any strategy, talking to a lot of different stakeholders. So when, when we come in and do a strategy for an organization, a little different because we're consultants and the first thing we do is talk to a lot of different people and we spend a lot of time really thinking through that you want to get the execs of course you also want to get the people in the field the people answering the phones the people manufacturing the cars the people serving the patients the teachers in the classroom whatever that is because they're feeling the actual pain and then the managers so so all different areas cross-functional from finance to hr etc because um, you're doing a few things one is uh, you're, you're trying to get all of the pain points. You're supposed to uh, understanding people's needs. You're also getting allies. You know, often the people we're talking to end up being the the data stewards and the data managers for with governance or, or your your champions. When we do this well and we do sell the management, it's not us talking. You know, when once we one of our more successful ones, marketing came with us and finance came with us, and they sold uh, for us you know, the data people. That works a lot better often. And my advice to you, <laughs> often it's so easy. We want this to be our strategy it's just because, of course, we spend a lot of time on it. A lot better when you're not talking and other people are selling your strategy. You want everyone to feel like it's their strategy. It should be. It's the company's strategy. So the more people that are kind of chiming in and agreeing with you is, is great. So you're doing several things there. Uh, that cartoon, yes, there are data cap cartoons. It's from one of my, my, my books. And we often have this up because often when we're talking kind of our sponsor and we say we want to do interviews, like, are people going to have anything to say? And I said, oh, you wait. All you have to say is tell me about your data and they'll go on. <laughs> and, and, and we're the weirdos that actually find that interesting, I suppose. Um, but everybody uses data, even folks you might not think of. Um, and most people have some pain points. So if we move to slide 16, um, I, I would, as I mentioned, um, give that some thought. Don't just talk to a bunch of people. And that's easy to do. And, and what you tend to do, human nature, talk to the people you know. Um, I, I did a management training class and probably one of the, you know, usually learn one thing in a class that sticks with you. And the one they had you do is just find someone in the room that was the most different from you as you could think of. And I um, found a short guy with black spiky hair that was in, in um, 
in, in in the legal department that I'd never talked to. And he looked different than me. He talked different than me. And he got a different, and, and he became my biggest ally because when I needed legal advice, he was there. And when he needed help with data, I was there, right? So it's easy, it would have been easy for me to talk to the data group, that's who I know. And, uh, so think, look at your company's org chart. Are we talking, think of what your company does. Are we talking to a broad range of people? And if you are an architect, um, we like to model things. We actually model out the people, depending on how complex it is. Sometimes we not only have their roles, but how they like to communicate, what their communicate, what their goals are. You know, a little personality analysis there. So then, then you're really understanding what makes them tick and how you can help them, because everyone's going to have a different um, viewpoint there. So if we go to the next slide, 17. Um, I mentioned that data governance is sort of a, a sister effort to to a data strategy because that has to do with a lot of the, the people and the policies and the procedures that are going to keep this going forward. So um, when we talk about data-driven business, um, when we, again, these surveys that we sort of do yearly, 76% um, had a data governance initiative in place or were planning one in the near future. That's positive. I'd like to see that higher, of course. It probably is by now. Um, but most organizations you know, are realizing that, um, and, and maybe if you've been in data management, you you're sort of nodding your head, of course. But to me, it's like trying to run a, a company without a finance department. How do you do that? <laughs> who manages the money? So with governance, you know, who manages the data? And, and, and as with finance, everybody in the organization manages the money, right? You can't just go on a business trip and not do an expense report. Um, so although there's a finance department, as is there's a data management department, it's really the responsibility of everybody. Um, and what I like to see is that last bullet is that over half of people – specifically said that improved collaboration was one of the big benefits of having not only data governance, but data architecture as well, which is what we see. And I was pleased to see that. It's a great way to get kind of business and IT together. If we move on to the, the next slide, um, kind of with our, our house, when we, we look at a data governance um, effort, we like to use kind of a structured framework. And this could be, and I think it is actually a whole presentation in and of itself. Um, but governance is one of those things that often people are kind of speaking at cross purposes, purposes, and they're all, both right. So when some people think of governance, they're thinking, I'm thinking of the org, the people, the data stewards, the data champions. Some people are thinking more of the tools, your metadata tool, your data lineage tool. Some people are thinking of the data management, the, the data models and the glossaries, and, and some people are thinking of the processes or the policies and the workflow, and they're all right, and they're all important. Um, but they don't always work together. And as part of working together, it's that kind of that top, are we all working towards the same vision and strategy, working on the same things, and do we have a culture where everyone's kind of working together? Um, so if you go to slide 19, um, on that note of culture and org, one of the things we often do is when you start with that data governance framework, which is the org structure for data governance, and this is a little meta, as they say, but in doing the org structure for governance, you need to look at the org structure of the company because that's going to be very different. Um, the, the, the org structure for governance on the right is, is almost your classic, you know, DEMA, DMBOK, if you're familiar with that, the data management body of knowledge, where you kind of have a hierarchy. There's your execs, there's the data governance steering, you have your kind of in the field data governance committee. That is often where we end up. It's, it's a very good framework, um, but that doesn't work for every company. Some companies might be more distributed, more federated. Um, we had um, one company that they wanted their data governance structure to be more of kind of concentric circles where it was just much more collaborative and, and less top down. And what you don't want to do, go, do is go to a company who just kind of, you know, box at hierarchy and show them something like something on the right. Um, so again, um, you really want to give that a lot of thought. Again, often where we see data governance fail that's not aligned with the strategy is people just say, let's get a bunch of people together and, and talk about data or the people we're already working with. You really need to be strategic about that. How do you organize a stewardship? Is it by data domain? Is it by business process? Is it by org? Is it by region? All the above. And do we have the right people in the room at the right level? Another thing that can go wrong is you have, and we've seen it all, <laughs> I, I, we had one where they had senior level execs going through and doing match merge strategies for governance uh, for master data and spending their whole day, you know, seeing if John Smith with John when John H. Smith were the same person. Very valuable thing, not a very valuable thing for the execs to be doing. <laughs> uh, funny that they didn't get funding for the next year. Um, or, or the other way around, people who are, are sort of not at a strategic role because there's no one leading that data strategy 
kind of are making decisions at the at the field level of you know if your DBA is is impl- implementing the or your data engineer is kind of implementing your business rules because they have to do something and no one's telling them so they they're doing the best thing so again getting the right people in the right room at, at the right level so um, going to the next slide um, twenty we've kind of touched on all of these but this was I found really interesting from uh, one of our earlier reports that when we said what what are your key drivers for the next several years that the top ones were data strategy, data architecture, and data governance, um, which is what we see a lot of and I think makes a lot of sense. They're kind of all again, you know, sisters to each other. One, you know, the strategy drives your data architecture and then the governance really supports that architecture and strategy. So I would say that they are kind of your triumvirate or your <laughs> your your three pillars of anything you'd need to do. Um, if we go to the, the next slide, uh, 21 uh, this is, again, something we do each year in terms of a key part of a data strategy is the technology. I, I don't want to belittle that. Are we going to go to the cloud? Are we going to stay on-prem? Um, w- what platforms are we going to use? Are we doing a data warehouse, a data lake, both? Um, but it shouldn't only be that. Where we sometimes see data strategies fail is that it's only a technical ex- you know, and, um, plan and it has nothing to do with the business. I'm a, I'm a tech geek. I get it. I love to play with the new stuff. I want to do IoT and data streaming and digital twins. I mean, there's so many things out there. Does it make sense? That wouldn't make sense for my business, right? Um, so you need to really what makes sense. What I find interesting here is that despite all of the really cool technologies out there, what still runs the business is your good old-fashioned relational database because they work for what they do. Are they the only solution? No. If you're only using relational I would highly recommend look elsewhere, but I think at the other extreme, a lot of, of you know vendors may say, oh, you don't need a relational database anymore. I'm like, how do you, you know, do some basic referential integrity? I mean, it, it, they are very good at what they do well. Are we seeing more go to the cloud? Absolutely. Um, so, But I find that in kind of an interesting chart. If we go to slide 22, the next slide, I mean, a big part of most data strategies are this idea, how do we get that trusted data? How do we build those trusted data sets for either self-service analytics or more enterprise analytics? And that takes a lot of things that we've been talking about, a good data architecture, having the right data quality, of course, privacy and security, metadata about what that information means, where it came from, and then the governance to who, who deems it as trusted. Do we all agree? What was so classic of, well, I trust my number and I trust my number, but those numbers don't match, all right? So can we all even agree? And, and again, both of those numbers might be right, we're just, you know, how do you calculate total sales? Well, I include wholesale and you include just retail. Neither one of us is wrong. We're just different, right? So that's where um, data governance can come into play. Um, slide 23, I like to, to stress, I know it's a busy slide, um, but generally with a, a data governance and data architecture, there are cer- certain tried and true architectural artifacts that I, I, I couldn't do a strategy or an implementation, even more important, without them. Your good old-fashioned data model that are never going to go away because those drive the rules of your business. A business process model to show where that data is used. Your, your data architecture diagram, this is one kind of your system-level view of the org. When we do a strategy, this is often what's missing. Again, not because people are bad. Often they have a great diagram of their own system, but nobody's had the time or the remit to really look enterprise-wide. How do all of these sit fit together, and that's where a strategy comes in. What are the policies and rules that align with that, and how are we monitoring things like data quality? What can scare people, especially when you use something like strategy, and then you use something like we need an architecture diagram, that just seems heavy and big and unwieldy, and to give people credit, it's because oftentimes they are big, and <laughs> and customer, you know, it might take you two years, but what we always do, and I, I recommend, is just do them in small chunks, kind of like agile. Let's pick a piece of the business and do one process and do the architecture around that, and start to get that in place with some wins, and then you build it over time. So don't skip them, just do them at a higher level. Um, slide 24, and I won't go into this in all detail, this kind of summarizes a lot of what this presentation does. A lot of people like this as a kind of a one-pager. Again, I've been given a strategy or building a new data program, what do I do and where do I start? So you don't necessarily have to do these in order, but it is kind of a handy checklist. Again, if, you, if any of if things aren't going well, what did I skip? Mm, Do I have senior level support? See that, unfortunately, too often. You might have a great architecture, make great dashboards, great everything, but nobody cares yet. You've got to sell it to them. Um, Or maybe I have support, but do I have the right architecture? Right. So kind of use this as a checklist. What people forget often is the stuff at the bottom. 
deliver quick wins, communicate, and then communicate again and communicate again and really show that over time um, and do that change management, which we'll talk about. Um, to, go, to go to slide 25, plan your roadmap. Don't just begin willy-nilly. And in that roadmap should have many things. Have the different areas. It's not an all or nothing, right? A bit of governance, a bit of analytics, a bit of master data, et cetera. Um, have some quick wins as well as a long term. Be realistic. Don't go to management and say, we're going to do a quick win in three months and that's it. It may take you two years to finish everything. So be honest there. And then what staff, staffing or training you might need for that. Um, if we go to slide 26, maybe obvious, but it's so e hard to forget this is that you need to A, align with what the business is doing. Again, are you rearranging the deck chairs in the Titanic or are you aligning with the big company strategy? And then even more um, tactically, is there is a big strategy and there's a big mar marketing launch in November. Can we do our data strategy launch to align with that? How can we help people? Or we're a school and the semester starting in September. Can we help with kind of the onboarding of students or whatever it is, or there's an audit coming up, something that not only you're aligning with the macro vision, but the micro things that are happening. So you're a help instead of a hindrance. Um, just quickly before, I, I know we do want to get to questions, but I know we do a lot of this in our, our practice, and we even have some folks in our team that are kind of trained in organizational change management. Um, and this is often what is forgotten at any company, um, but the, the strategies that tend to win have some sort of, this isn't change management like software change management. That is, we probably need a better word. But this is how you change the organization. How do you change hearts and minds? And there's a lot of different methodologies. There's ProSci, there's, you know, uh, that's one we often use. Um, but they all kind of go down to the same thing. Am I aware of the product problem? And that was kind of that selling. Do I care? What's in it for me? Um, you know, maybe uh, there's this new software that that's nice, but how is it going to help me? Um, and then, you know, it, how, what's the, the knowledge about that? And then reinforcing that over time. So if we go to the next slide, maybe some examples of that with the little people bubbles. Um, hey, great. That's great. Should I be worried about that? Should we be excited about it? What often helps is are other people in the org excited about that? When I talked earlier about getting your stakeholders and getting other champions, you know, may maybe I never recycled before and I think it's stupid, but suddenly I'm at a party and everyone else is putting their stuff in recycling. I'm the only one that doesn't. Hmm, I kind of feel like a jerk, <laughs> right? So um, maybe that was a strange example, but generally if the whole company is starting to get excited about that, I start to pay attention. And then, okay, I pay attention. What do I do? Well, how, would I, how would I use this? How would it help me? And then that reinforcing over time, what we tend to do is launch and then go over to something else. Remember, other people, that's the first, you've been working on it for a year. This is the first time they've heard about it. So that's often where we see things fail. You forget. <laughs> you forget because you're excited about the next thing. Do more training. Show, Remind people of how this helped. Remind them what it looked like before. Remember when we used to do this through paper? Now it's all automated. Isn't that great? Um, and we tend to move on. So that might be the biggest takeaway. We've had a lot in our training more questions about this. How do I keep that org change management uh, moving over time? Uh, so slide 29 in summary, um, talked a lot about the business side of data with a data strategy, but to me that is what a data strategy is, and it's orchestrating that people process tech around, around that. Um, there's definitely a tools aspect of it, but pick the right tool for the right job and have a roadmap that builds over time with quick wins, but have it tell that story and make sure everybody sees themselves as part of that story. So before we open up for questions, if we go to slide 30, just to remind folks, if you're interested in master data management, that's what we'll be talking about next month. Um, slide 31 is a blatant plug that we do this for a living. And if you need help, come find us. And then slide 32, we will open it up for, for questions. And I'll, I'll look to you, Shannon, to help us with that. Over to you, Love Shannon. it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Shana, for this great presentation. And just to answer the most commonly asked question, it's just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email for this webinar by end of day Monday with links to the slides, the recording, and anything else requested. And the um, so just diving in here. So um, are you aware of any data-driven cities or counties? I, I work for a county government, and this is intriguing. Um, very much so um, in several levels. Um, uh, open open data is a, a big part of a lot of either federal or local agencies. You know, what can we make public uh, to, you know, some of the information about transportation, about COVID, about education, um, uh, sharing data sets. 
Um, some of it is putting more services online. That's that's digital transformation, right? Um, some cities and counties are doing being much more literally data driven with IoT and, and footfall traffic. And we're going to build a street, and, and we know from you know sensor data or traffic patterns um, what we're going to do. And making that public has been a big part. Um, uh, of that, of how you made that decision. And the, mo there's a lot of data nerds out there, especially kids in school doing data science projects and things. Um, I've seen some company uh, orgs do a, uh, what do you call it, the hackathon, right, by making some public data sets open for the for cities and counties and, and kind of doing, we're doing a big project now for a Middle Eastern uh, country that's really trying to be more data driven and what do they, what do they publish and what don't they? So yeah, absolutely. And, and kind of that, that sector, it's a definitely a growing, a growing thing and probably a lot of good examples. You can kind of Google and find this, some good stuff out there. What's next? I love it. And Mahit, feel free to join in at any time. And um, if you have any examples as well, um, to add in. Uh, but let me dive to the next question. What is your definition of data-driven organization? Are there levels of data-driven? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, what one level, just at that macro, is the one I mentioned in the beginning. Are you a data-driven or, or are you a data company? That's probably the biggest. Um, but one I might re, kind of refer to, if you, almost if you think of kind of this famous Gartner, you know, stages of analytics, there's kind of the descriptive um, and, and just, uh, I don't know how to be de deprecating to the companies, but a lot of companies are still there. Do I even know my total sales by region, by rep, by just getting that? Can I, can I understand that company, my company, and have the metrics around it? A lot of companies still aren't there. And then get to more prescriptive. Do I know what's going to happen in the future um, or, or predictive? Um, and, and then can I drive behavior from that. So that insurance company that I mentioned um, is that every sales rep gets a data dashboard and that's how they do their sales calls. That That's much at the higher level of can I can I drive behavior. So one is are people asking questions when they make a decision, even looking at a dashboard? Is the data right? Does everyone know they have a part in it? Two, data is so inherent of how you drive your business. Um, that's really a key part of everyone's actions. So yeah, a lot of different levels and then a lot of places to start. But Curious if Mohit, if you had any other thoughts on that. You know, I, I, I totally agree with you, Donna. And I think uh, giving business users the, the freedom to explore and, and build insights or data mm -hmm. insights is, is absolutely key in, in, in all of this, right? Um, and, and and this is what I what I tell all of my customers too, right? That, uh, you know, there is, there is a lot going on, right? There is a lot to think about. There is a lot going on in the space. And and like uh, you know, like they say, Rome Rome was not built in one day, right? Uh, so so right. similarly, similarly, you know, data data analytics is, is more of an iterative process. It it takes trials and errors. Uh, sometimes sometimes you you have to fail first to 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 understand and 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 win later, right? So 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 I think having having an agile data strategy. Um, that can help you pivot and, and change course uh, based on either your business requirements or, or the questions that you're getting from users is, is, is also one of the, one of the critical areas uh, you know, for, for you to be successful. Yeah, that's a great point. A lot of industry specific questions here too. You know, how would you propose building a business case if you are a public health government agency? Uh, business a business case. Um, yeah, I think it would be different. Um, I, again, when I spoke in the beginning, um, you know, what does a data strategy look like? Often these kind of public health, you know, when I said, you know, do the PowerPoint, everyone should do a PowerPoint, right? But often these kind of public, it is more of that, a published data strategy and showing the benefits and making that public, um, you know, making it public, showing some of the benefits. Uh, again, we're working with a couple governments right now, and there's that, you know, some of it's monetization in terms of efficiency and some of it's public benefit. Um, we had a few that with COVID, that was a big, you know, showing uh, statistics to COVID and, and, and kind of how that's linked. Uh, a lot of folks, that was finally where people became data-driven. They kind of got what that meant. Um, but I think for the, the public health, it's, or, or work, how do we work with other agencies doing things similarly? Uh, we're working with one big org that's kind of doing a lot of kind of AIDS um, and COVID research and a big part of their benefit was the alliances they have with how they can share data and 
it's not just about them. It's about you know kind of the wider community. So yeah, definitely different than selling widgets or manufacturing widgets. But you know some of the same fundamentals apply. You know the what's in it for me? Is it is it saving money and cost? Is it working for the greater good? I think is you know some of that mission driven. And I'll shut up and let Mohit answer in the middle. But um, we've had some good success with kind of the nonprofits, or we work with some hospitals and just creating a mission statement for why we're sharing data. And, and one of the, the research companies we're working with in public health, that really helped them of, you know, we, we at our core want to share data and help the world. And at our core, we're working with really private health information. And we all understand that balance. So when we're pushing back, we're not trying to be, you know, not team players or whatever, but that is a very difficult situation we're in. And just kind of saying that out loud really helped people that, yeah, this is a hard problem and we all want to solve it together. But Mohit, did you have any other thoughts? I'd be curious. No, no, I think uh, you, you covered it all. I, I totally agree. I think, um, yeah. you know, sharing, sharing data, uh, you know, even even at the peer level, right? And, and I think this is this is one of the things that 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 we are looking to do in Encoda is to is to also, you know, how to how to how to harness the power of uh, you know everybody who is who is, who is using um, you know Encoda as a as a as a data analytic solution uh, and and not just not just limited to 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 within 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 your company and and, and I mean how how can you how can you collaborate across organizations to be, you know, to be to be more successful in this area? Well, I love it. Well, thank you both so much for this great presentation, but I'm afraid that is all the time we have for this webinar. Thanks to so much to our attendees. You are all just the best, so patient, and thank you for working with us as we struggle through a couple of technical issues. Um, and just love that you're sitting there helping each other out throughout the webinar. It's just, it's just awesome. And yes, we will get you some more information about Incorda um, and make sure that you have get the links to how to get more demos and we'll bring them back for more stuff. They they are also sponsoring the research paper that Donna was talking about this year in Corda is. Um, we'll have the survey going out March 1st as part of our March EDU. We celebrate Data Education Month in March. So um, take a look for that survey coming out. Well, thanks everybody. Hope you all have a great day. Thanks to Encorda for sponsoring today. Donna, thanks as always. Mohit, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Donna.